Now look how this place looks. This is what happened between the time we left at 4 p.m. and today. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hey everyone, it's George the Antique Nomad, and what a difference a day makes. It is a drippy, drizzly morning here in Princeton, Indiana at Collector's Carnival. All my friends are running around somewhere. We got sort of split up in the parking because it's busy. And you can tell, because there's all sorts of people here, and it is only 8 in the morning. The general public don't even come in until 9, so... There is a lot set up that we didn't see yesterday. There's an entire tent over here that I never went into, so I think I'm going to start there. I think everyone else probably went to the guy we got all the great deals from yesterday, which was smart, but I feel like we dug through that pretty well. So let's see what we've got in here. These are the typical 70s school chairs, but I love that double hole in the back. It's just a neat shape. It looks like a face, like a goblin or something. Explosive crate. Yep, there's some neat stuff here, but his prices are pretty much retail, and I'm here to buy for resale, so I'm going to go look at some other stuff. This one with the Crocs, I think, was just starting to get out yesterday, but most of these outdoor vendors just set up either this morning or overnight. And he's doing what I do. It shows when it gets wet. You put a cover over it and you sell it anyway. At least people can see through and see what's in or there. He's got a lot of cool kitchen stuff, but I did see this yesterday, so I'm not going to disrupt it and get it wet for no good reason. I like the big wheels here. Looks like he's got about 115 a pair. That's a good price, 125 a pair on those. It's actually pretty inexpensive in some parts of the country. This is farm country, so you see more of these. If I were headed to Washington right now, I'd buy these because I could sell them for double. This thing's cool. It is by an obscure company called Kalin of California, which is one of the various small potteries. There are about 2,000 in California, so hard to know them all. But Kalin dated this one for 1952. It's similar to what DeForest was doing, but this one is different because this one's actually for spooning lard which was an ingredient in almost everything back then. This one's very cute. Only $22, that looks like a DeForest. And then the bank head here is DeForest. And I like those, I think I might pick one up. 11 to the 17th, here in Princeton. Well, we're gonna take a look in here because we had so much fun in his space yesterday. I just wanna make sure I didn't miss anything because they were digging out more boxes. I see some more jewelry. This piece looks a little better finished than a lot, although it's missing a stone, but that's fixable. But otherwise, it looks kind of like the same stuff. There's the long green swan dish, which I think is Duncan and Miller. I might be interested in that if he's as inexpensive as he was yesterday. Now look how this place looks. This is what happened between the time we left at 4 p.m. and today and it's only been open for an hour. People worked very hard to get all of this out. Each dealer probably spent four to six hours setting up, but they've brought some really neat things for us, and it's fun to see how it looks when it's done. So let's see what else they found, because there were some dealers we did pretty well with in here yesterday, and I'm gonna go hit them first. When I first was in the business, we sold these at the Pilgrim Glass Outlet in Washington State. They were called Blossom Holders. They're very pretty. They basically borrowed the idea from the Murano designers, but they did it in cranberry glass, and it has that nice label that they used in the 80s and 90s. They went out of business about 2000. When the first Gulf War came, a lot of companies couldn't make it anymore because the natural gas got too expensive. That one's Louisville stoneware. That's very different from what they usually do. 
nice old Fenton Thistle Carnival Bowl. That's a pattern we see fairly often, but it's a nice one. This is unusual. This is Red Winged Nicomus, the elephant here. Neat glaze. A lot like what you think of Francoma or the Southern Potteries doing. A lot of people don't realize Red Wing did that. This one, Gaylord Golf Club. And it says it right on there. And this is a little flask. This little elephant guy here, I always think of elephants because Fatbird Fines likes them. He looks like he might be a rose mead. The glaze has that sort of orange skin feel that rose mead glazes tend to have. It's not marked, but this would have been a hard one to mark with such small areas. And here's another variation on McCoy's Happy Face mug. This is the red on white. They even did a bicentennial one. That one's pretty hard to find. This little guy is $12. The ones that aren't yellow do go for a little more, typically. Oh, this is the prayer we used to say at meals when I was a kid. That one appears to be by Federal Glass, I believe. It's similar to their Tom and Jerry sets. This fellow was here last time. He has a lot of brewer yam. Cooks is local and this is cardboard, so most of them are really destroyed. That's why it's a hundred and a quarter. It's going to be from right after World War II. The little Pfeiffer's man at 45. You would think he'd be more, but they turn up fairly often compared to some. Riddle's Ale. And cans. Here's a pretty color of Depression Glass you don't see very often. This is Blue Mayfair. It's an unusual color of blue. Not many companies made back then. And it's got the Mayfair floral pattern. It's a very nice drop base. And there's the vegetable bowl. 1930s, of course. And then a bunch of the green depression that does glow under a black light. And then the same in pink. Pink is kind of underappreciated in the market right now. It's a good time to start collecting it if you like it. At some point it will be rediscovered. Fenton Aqua back there. And of course the Fenton Burmese, which all glows under a black light and has always been more expensive. It was hard for them to make. And it's more desirable now. Look at these cute Bakelite pins. The hat with all the things hanging below. This one's really good because it's got the, I think he's supposed to be a sailor. That's Second World War. And then the horse head. These are all likely to be in the $150 to $200 range and up. The older original Bakelite can still be rather expensive, although the prices have come down a lot in the last 10 or 15 years. And then this is interesting, the way they use the coral. In fact, I think I need to look at that one. It's so funny when you run into something you sold somebody. I sold this at an estate sale, and I know it's the same one because it was torn in exactly this place. It's a little wrist fur slit with the little micro beads. And it had the same shoe at the bottom. That's so funny. This gal must have come to my estate sale in Kentucky. Here's some really neat promotional cars for Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Isn't that cool? Look at the Wilbur Shaw signature. These are very unusual. What is the story on the metal cars? Those are the cars that Tony Holman gave to each of the drivers as they came. Oh. And the drivers, the sponsors of the cars. Oh, only I see. Went to the drivers and the sponsors of the cars. Wow, how neat. Yeah, I've never seen them. I'm not from this area originally, and I've never seen them anywhere, so I figured they had to be very limited. Yeah, and then the um, lighters were also gifts that Tony gave away. Oh, how cool. Yeah, the ones in the box are in the original box that he gave them in. 
and then the other one we don't have the box for. Wow, how interesting. So he had them specially made up by Zippo to give to the drivers. Yes. How and cool. The, and, the, and the owners of the cars. Wow, neat. And he was the promoter of the Speedway back in the 50s, wasn't he? Yeah, he was the owner. Mm -hmm. He owned the Speedway, him and um, Wilbur Shaw was also involved in the Speedway. Oh, so that's the reason that's Wilbur the, Shaw's yeah. name is on this piece, okay. That's very rare. Oh, I'm Wilbur sure. Shaw. Absolutely. Well, that, thank you very much for the education. No I really enjoy seeing something I haven't seen before. Yeah. Really? Well, he, he had a brewery in Terre Haute, uh -huh. and they went on strike in Terre Haute, yeah. and so he just said, I'll need it. Forget close, it, close we'll it just... Down with Devin. So then Cooks became connected with... Ah, uh, interesting. I did not know that history either. Thank you. Yeah. Well, they have really neat stuff. It's very specific and really cool. And no semi-parking allowed. Well, that's part of the reason I really love going to antique shows is because you get to find out things that you never knew before about things you've never seen before, especially when you're in different regions. I had no idea that the Indianapolis Speedway owners were giving premiums specifically to the drivers, and what a rare and unusual thing to find. By the way, uh, since I'm taking a break here, I just wanted to remind you to please subscribe because then you can click that button and be notified of future videos. Please thumbs up this video to like it, and please leave a comment. We like to know you're out there watching. If you could share this with your friends, that'd be great. And if you're interested in memberships or information about other things happening on the channel, please click the community tab, click join, or look in the description to find the link for memberships, and we'll tell you all about it there. Now let's get back to shopping. Here's a neat wall mirror, the triple mirror out of the 1920s. $98 is a pretty fair price for it. It seems to be in good shape. Here is a neat early Bentwood rocker. This is what they looked like back in folk days when people were just making them themselves by hand. And this one's got nice detail, interesting shape. You can tell that it's handmade because it was not entirely uniform because they were using what they could find. You see where they use the slats for the bench seat here. And there's the tacking they use. Those tacks look like something that would have been made right around 1900. So that's a pretty cool thing. Electrification comes in the 1930s and you see this depression glass juicer with the little motor on top instead of the hand crank. So this is a transition piece. It's priced at 50 If it works, that's pretty reasonable because the hand crank ones usually sell for that much. This is my friend Lucas. He sells at Preservation Station in Owensboro and he does a lot of advertising. He seems to be pretty successful at it. He has figured out the market in this area. They like rust, they like signs, they like architectural pieces, and so he always he tends to get a good selection of each. The thing I like is this tire stand, because I just like tire stands, so I'm going to ask him about the price on that. Here's an interesting piece to show. It's not a terribly uncommon piece. This is by the Dugan Company that notice it's honeycomb on the front and on the back you have flowers and beads. So you have a couple of different patterns going on there. And that's something to look at with carnival glass because sometimes it shows differently from the back than the front. I like the amethyst base for carnival glass. This one has nice color in the iridescence. You can see the whole range of colors from blues and purples to golds. Fenton pine cone pattern I don't see as often. They have a few pieces of it too. Here's more of these sieves that are coming out of old labs now. $20 a piece is a pretty reasonable price. I definitely see them sell higher in some places. Neat old coffee mill in the tin there. Belmont hardware. A lot of times you would buy this sort of thing at the local general store and they'd be carrying hardware as well. So the hardware companies would do things for people to use in other parts of the house besides the garage. 
here's one of the soybean license plates. During and shortly after the Second World War, Illinois made their license plates out of this. It was something that would not rust, which was nice, because they had terrible problems with rust on license plates in Illinois. But they're also kind of flimsy, so they didn't always hold up too well. So they're kind of hard to find, fairly collectible, and $20 is not a bad price. It's one of the least expensive I've seen in a long time. And then look at this crazy car. An American Legion car in a parade in 1948. Look at that jalopy and what they've done to it. It's definitely a send-up of 1920s jalopies where they paint slogans all over everything, but that one's got that crazy paint job under it too. That's pretty cool. The uninvited guest, well, heavens. Hunters ought to know not to leave their stuff out to attract the bears to camp, although I guess it means you don't have to go out and find the bear. This is a Firestone ad from 1930. A lot of ad calendar premiums in the 20s and 30s. Here's a neat oak shaving stand. It's got nice carving at the top, the mirror adjusts. He's got a little collection of barber brushes, and then you have your drawer and a dual cabinet there, and the cabinet is offset so that you have a larger space and then this smaller drawer. I'm not going to pull them out because it's tall and on a pedestal and I don't want to do any damage to it by pulling with one hand when I should be holding it with the other. It's priced $175. That seems like a good price for something unusual if you had a use for it. And then there's a sit-on floor fan for $69. That seems to be about what they go for now if they run. Next to a, a Falstaff beer tapper. This looks like it is made of a very heavy styrofoam. So I can't imagine many of these little tapper kegs have last, and it's $39. Piece of palace I see very seldomly. Great owl on it. Kansas City. This is advertised as a pen holder. It may also have been used for foam scrapers for beer. It has a couple of hairline cracks, otherwise I'd be tempted to get it. And it's got a really neat transfer on the back with the woman with the Trojan helmet dated 1907. That's kind of unusual. Next to it is a West Clock Big Ben with the original box, and these have gone up in value quite a bit lately. I don't see their price on it, I'm going to have to ask. This one says made in Germany though, and I'm not sure this is actually a Big Ben. It may not be the original clock for the box. This is a check mutilator. Before you had a shredder, this is what you used to crunch up old checks so that you didn't have your signature out there. It's by the Cummins Company of Chicago. This would be the drawer where the little bits would come out at the end after you mutilated the check with this huge Horkin device. $70 on that. It's an interesting thing. I rarely run into these. And then this guy is standing up in the First World War for democracy. I don't know how much this is, but I'm going to ask because I like the frame. This is what they call an Adirondack frame, where it looks like it's basically twigs or sticks and they look rough. And that was on purpose. This is right around the beginning of the arts and crafts era. They started being made in New York and sold as souvenirs to people going to the Adirondacks, and pretty soon the style caught on everywhere. They are asking $10 each on the razors, and I don't have any in stock, so I'm going to take a look at these. If they've got the right razor for the right box and the condition is good, I'll probably get a couple. Well, I'm a big fan of Banks, and he's got a bunch of still Banks here, and he said that they are old mall stock that he would like to move, so I'm going to see what he'll do on a couple, because I see some really neat ones here that I like. I like the Billiken, and the one behind it is Mutt and Jeff, old cartoon characters that may be so far back that no one remembers them, but I do. So, he's got the mailbox, he's got the seated pig, the lion, the house, a couple of clocks, so there's some fun ones here. Well, this dealer is Ben, and he knows my friend Dave, who I did the antique advertising video of a while back. And he wants me to show him this Belmont tin, because this is a very hard-to-find pocket tin for tobacco. He has it priced at $2.45, and I imagine Dave will covet it. Tell him that's the early variation. 
Yeah. Oh, is it? Okay. Yes. There's Interesting. Two, two variations of that. Okay, and this is the earlier of the two. Early being what? Teens or twenties? He would know better than. Me. Yeah. Neat. Twenty-five. Yeah, that's a good deal. That's really cool. Do you mind if I take a picture sure. of it? No, go right ahead. Yeah, so this is Owl Fine Cut Tobacco, and it's a hard one to find, and a lovely lady next to me is buying it, so I have to let go. <laughs> Look how cute she is. Soul Kiss Perfume. That's just a great name. The condition isn't perfect, but everything else about her is wonderful. She's got the daisy chain in her hair. This is going to be from right about 1900. He's got 55 on it. For the condition, that's probably about right. This is the fellow who's got the really cool tasty food with Miss Sunbeam. I'm going to buy some banks from him. And I wanted to show this because I go to the flea market in Greenville, Kentucky, and there is an ad from an old auto parts store that also dealt with chainsaws. And you can tell it's old because it's phone 57, but at night they got a second phone, and by then there were three digit numbers, so they got number 568. That's likely to date to about 1930. Okay, here's something weird and interesting. Get in on the secret. Get into a Kohler beer. This looks like those lamps they did in the 1960s that were psychedelic and peace signs and things like that. So I think it's going to be that era. It's $65 and on the back it says, Uncle Jackson says get into a Kohler beer. Well, if Uncle Jackson says it, then it must be a great idea. Now this is only $20, and I am not sure why. It looks like an old German tankard. It, it would be a stein, but I don't see the lid. It's got the old mark from Germany. 1921 is the date we see on there. I can't imagine why this is so inexpensive. Friedekin is frolicking or happiness and they look like they're having happiness. They're Alf Schneider. I just think this is something I need for that price. $30 each, your choice of coffee tins. Coffee tins are very collectible and they actually do five for a hundred, so that's 20 each, and that's a pretty reasonable price. They've got big ones and little ones. This is just such a neat display. A lot of these are 1950s era. And they just do a ton of old packaging. Look at all the jars. Back when coffee was sold in jars, which is a 40s, 50s thing. And then they've got some even more unusual and older ones. This one's $100. Look at the great graphic on that. As with everything, when you're talking about tins, they rate on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being perfect condition with no damage. That's what you want if you can find it. I have been told by many collectors that at first they bought anything that they could find and then as time went on they realized that they really only wanted to buy the best. And so if you're collecting you might want to start by saving your money and buying things in better condition. Lots of tobacco tins. This guy has just got a ton of great advertising. I'm sure he does the big advertising show in Indianapolis. Lots of pencil toppers, priced around $10 each. All sorts of razor blade pieces. They're selling 50 for $39. That's actually a pretty good price. I get about $3 each for these. I'm kind of tempted to buy another set because I'm low on them. And then we've got tape measures. So he's got lots of fun advertising things. Well, Jenny is here and she has wonderful jewelry and I'm buying a bunch of it and I'm very excited. She's got uh, some really nice little sets here and all of these pieces as well are coming with me. There's a Trafari butterfly set with the enamel at the end. And this set here is Kramer, so they're nice. And she has wonderful jewelry, actually. She just has an entire booth full of it. I'll try not to bug the people, but uh, look how much she's got. I mean, just trays and trays and trays. I could certainly spend a lot more time and a lot more money if I had either of those things. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. 
Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!